Chapter 13 ends with Abraham and his nephew Lot separating from each other. Till then, they'd traveled together. But God's blessing on Abraham overflowed onto Lot. Their households became so large, their flocks so extensive, they were simply too great to share the sometimes limited pasturage that they often passed through. So Lot moved eastward toward the Jordan Plain and ended up settling in the near and at that time ultra-wicked city of Sodom. Abraham continued his nomadic lifestyle to the west, leading his household and flocks around the central highlands of Canaan. Lot's move to Sodom quickly got him into trouble. Verse 1, And it came to pass in the dames of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Elisar, Kedar Loamar, the king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. Let's pause right there. That word nations in Hebrew is goyim, kind of a generic term for the Gentiles. Verse 2, that they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adma, Shemeber, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedalarmar, and in their thirteenth year they rebelled. Now, our idea of a king, it's largely drawn from European monarchs of the Middle Ages. We think of someone who rules over a nation, which itself is a collection of provinces, each with several cities and towns. But kings of Abraham's day, which was right around the year 2000 BC, they were rulers of a city that dominated its region. That dominance usually came as a result of conquest. Sometimes it might be through simple economic advantage. Now, these were called city-states because their main feature was a single dominant city ruled by a single ruler. So think less king and more mayor with a personal police force and you get the idea. Now here's the situation at the outset of chapter 14. Four city-state rulers in Mesopotamia, north of Canaan at about a distance of 400 miles, had banded together to exert their will over other city-states around them. It wasn't hard to do since these ancient city-states were usually at odds with each other. Well, it seems that Kadalamar, the ruler of Elam, came up with what at that time seemed a genius idea. Instead of fighting between Elam, Elisar, Shinar, and Goyim, which was likely the name of a small region of several medium-sized cities rather than a single large city, why not band together in what would have been regarded as an unstoppable force? This alliance then extended its reach south as far as the Dead Sea, which at that time wasn't nearly as salty as it is today. The Jordan River flowed much more heavily at that time, providing plenty of water for the ultra-fertile fields along its banks. And that's why Lot had decided to move that direction when he split from Abram. In chapter 13, the area is described as lush and verdant. You may remember from our last study, we read this in Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. So the five cities mentioned in verse 2 were an easy target for those four Mesopotamian rulers because they had done the usual silly, petty city-state thing and they had been at odds with each other. So Kadalamar's alliance marched south and put them under tribute. But 400 miles is no easy trek. So why go all that way? Why subjugate those city-states? Well, the answer to that is pretty easy, because they were rich. The Mesopotamians knew that they were because they had been trading with them. The five cities of the Jordan Plain all lay along the trade route that connected Egypt and the Saudi Arabian Peninsula to the south, to Mesopotamia and Europe to the north. All that trade had to pass through that very region. Some of it hugged the coast, but the lion's share of it at that time passed along the Dead Sea and then along the Jordan River because it provided fresh water. The Mesopotamians knew that these cities were rich and militarily easy pickings. They didn't want to rule them, they just wanted a hefty annual tribute from them. Well, that lasted for 12 uneasy years. And then the southern cities got smart. Why keep paying tribute when, if they banded together as the Mesopotamians had, well, they could turn the tables. After all, it would be five against four. It's simple math, for goodness sakes. So in the 13th year, they told the Mesopotamians to <laughs> buzz off. Well, the Mesopotamians couldn't allow that to go unanswered. What message would that send to other city-states that they dominated? So they needed to march south and teach those uppity cities of the Jordan Plain a lesson. 
Now listen, for years, critics of the Bible have used Genesis 14 as an example of how inaccurate it is. They base their criticisms on the supposed fact that none of the names of the kings listed in this Mesopotamian confederacy find any correlation in history. That is no longer true. Every name in this list has been found connected to these locations at that time. In fact, there are several words here that are remarkable for their use and description of the events recounted because they were precisely the words used at that time. For instance, title is identified as the King of Nations, Goyim. This was the term used at that time to describe a region populated by numerous loose tribal groups. There was a ruler from that region who united them into a formidable fighting force which allied with several other Mesopotamian city-states. Historians and archaeologists have found that for this time in history, this kind of alliance was the standard arrangement for one city-state that wanted to expand. The king would find three or four neighboring kings who were ready to launch out and they would form a military pact, reaching out to put bordering regions under tribute. Verse 5, In the fourteenth year, Kedalimer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtoreth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shaveth Kiriabatham, uh, verse 6, and the Horites in their mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amrites who dwelt in Hezizan Tamar. Now, before attacking the Jordanian city-states directly, the Northern Alliance swept through the regions around them, making sure that they couldn't gain allies and extra forces, and then they entered into battle with the five rebel kings. Archaeologist Nelson Gluick documents the destruction left in these regions by these four kings. He says this, quote, I found that every village in their path had been plundered and left in ruins, and the countryside laid waste. The population had been wiped out or led away into captivity. For hundreds of years thereafter, the entire area was like an abandoned cemetery, hideously unkempt, with all its monuments shattered and strewn in pieces on the ground." Unquote. We read on in verse 8, "...and the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Kedalimer, the king of Elam, Tidal, the king of nations." Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the provisions, and went their way. So the five kings of the Jordan plain were routed, caught in the asphalt pits of the lowland near the Dead Sea. What was left of their force fled to the hills leaving the cities wide open to attack. The Mesopotamians swept in, sacked them, taking goods and slaves. And among them was somewhat of interest to us, but even more so to Abram. Verse 12, they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the, uh, the Amorite, brother of Ishgal and his brother Anar and they were allies with Abram. Now, chapter 13 ended with Abram moving his tent from Bethel to this place in Hebron by the terebinth trees of Mamre. The writer wants us to see verses 1 through 12 of chapter 14 as kind of a background. The real focus in this entire story is on Abram, who the story now returns to. He's living peacefully in Hebron, allied with three brothers who form a notable clan. Abraham's just chilling, enjoying God's goodness, when one day a messenger comes with an urgent plea. Lot's been taken captive in the Battle of the Jordan Plain. The messenger went all that way because he knew that Abraham wouldn't just want to know he was honor-bound by the rules of family to go after Lot. And so it was. Now, verse 14, Now, when Abraham heard that his brother, and just pause right there, the word there can be translated as relative, was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So we read here that Abraham had 318 men of fighting age who'd been born in his house. Well, this gives us an idea of just how big Abraham's clan had grown and why he and Lot had had to split up not uh, long before this. 
But a little, little over 300 guys doesn't sound like much of a force compared to the, that northern alliance. After hearing about all the territory that they had conquered in the earlier verses, we get the sense it had to have been a pretty good sized force. Ah, but it wasn't just Abraham's 318 who went out after them. Remember his three Amorite allies. They went as well, as we'll discover later. And they all had their own troopers. Now, if each had a household of close to the size of Abram's, it could have been a force of a thousand that went in pursuit of these raiders. So Abram and his allies armed their men and went in pursuit of the northern forces who were headed home. They caught up with them about a hundred miles north and then began harassing them while it was still dark. And when it says that Abram divided his forces, it means that he engaged in a kind of guerrilla warfare setting ambushes and nipping at the flanks of the enemy force as it sped north. This went on for another 50 miles or so. And finally, the Northern Alliance realized that the loot and prisoners that they had taken were slowing them down. And so they dropped them and hightailed at home. Verse 16. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. So Abraham rescued Lot and all those that the Northerners had intended to turn into slaves. There was a mass of loot as well, more than had been taken just from the cities of the Jordan Plain. Remember that the Northerners had all that loot that they had collected on their raids before they attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and their sister cities. Uh, Verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. Today we know that as the Kidron Valley on the east side of Jerusalem, after his return from the defeat of Kedalomer and the kings who were with him. So the king of Sodom, who during the battle with the northern kings had gotten caught in the slime pits mentioned in verse 10, he managed to extricate himself. He heard of Abraham's successful raid and went to meet him as he was returning. Now before they met, Abraham encountered a far more important and interesting person. Verse 18, Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God, Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Now Melchizedek stands out at this point in the story because we don't expect to encounter someone besides Abraham who knew God, let alone knew him so intimately, or was connected to God in such a remarkable manner. So just who is this Melchizedek? Where did he come from? Well, note what it says about him. First of all, his name means king of righteousness. Second, he's the king of Salem, from the Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace. And many take this as the ancient name for Jerusalem. So Melchizedek is both a king of righteousness, of peace, and of Jerusalem. Verse 3, he's called the priest of God Most High, El Elyon, the name that is used in the Old Testament when the priests were serving and worshiping God in the temple, which would much later be built where? In Jerusalem. And fourth, he blessed Abram. Now, in biblical categories, the lesser is always blessed by the greater. Fifth, he brought out bread and wine to Abram as signs of blessing and fellowship. Bread and wine. Does that recall anything to your memory? And finally, Abram gave a tithe, a tenth of all the spoils of the battle to Melchizedek. Now, we can say with certainty who this Melchizedek was, but the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7 says that we are to understand him as a picture, a type of Jesus Christ, because, first, he has no beginning and no end. Second, he's the king of righteousness and peace, who's also a priest, bridging the space between God and man. And third, he comes with bread and wine, the symbols of communion. It's crucial to note the measure that Abraham used when giving to the king of Salem, a tithe, which means a tenth part. There are some today who want to say that tithing is a command of the Mosaic law that no longer applies, because we're under grace, not the law. It's true that tithing was commanded under the law. God codified the tithe and expanded it to include additional tithes, actually. Once you total up all the offerings of the Mosaic law, it comes out to an annual giving percentage of about 23 and a third percent. But what we're reading is long before the law, about 600 years before it. The measure that Abraham used when giving to the Lord was a tenth. Verse 21. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. 
But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I've made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Honor, Ashkel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. So Abram turns from the king of Salem to face the king of Sodom. How often is it that immediately after we've enjoyed a time of intimacy and blessing with God, we find the devil all up in our grill, <laughs> making sometimes a counteroffer? This seems to be a common testimony of those who attend a weekend church retreat. They have an intense time at the retreat. God seems really close to them. Then they get home to discover World War III has broken out in the family or there's been some major crisis at work. With the promise of God's blessing still ringing in his ears, Abram finds the wicked king of Sodom right there to offer him riches. Take the loot, just leave the people to me. How typical. If Melchizedek is a type of Christ, who's the king of Sodom a type of? Yeah, the devil. He says, hey, you can have all the stuff, just let me have the folk. How often does the devil make that offer to us? He promises us a comfortable life of pleasure just so long as we don't threaten his kingdom by telling others about the Lord. How many men and women have been seduced off the mission field with the promise of earthly treasure? How many have shut up their testimony for fear of, well, losing their position at work or among their peers? The devil's ready to make that trade any day. You can have the goods, just give me the souls. Abraham says, no way. I'll take not a shoelace from you. God is my reward, and I will not find one ounce of my treasure anywhere else. My fortune rises and falls at God's bidding. I'll not mix his blessing with yours. Abraham will not bind his allies who've gone with him under the same ethic and standard that he's committed to. Something for us to think about when it comes to the issue of making others live by our convictions. Look at how Abram refers to God, to Yahweh, now that he's speaking to the king of Sodom. He calls God El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. These are the titles that Melchizedek had just used for God. You see, Abram has a new and fresh revelation of the Lord, and it sparked a vow from him. In his tithe to Melchizedek, Abram lifted up his hand in a solemn oath to God that no one could claim to have made Abram rich. He ensured that all credit would go to God and God alone for his success. When we define success by human measures and then pursue such success through worldly methods, how can we say that really God has blessed us if success comes? How much better to let God raise you up so that he gets the glory and you know that it was his work? That's true whether at school or at work or in just the business of living. It's also true in the life of the church. There are endless programs that are pumped out today to manufacture church growth. Compare that to the church in the book of Acts, which prayed, loved one another in sincerity and simplicity, depended on the Holy Spirit, and preached the gospel. We read that God added to their number daily. Is that the method of church growth that we ought to follow, or do we think that maybe man has come up with a better plan? Mm -hmm.